Hi, Michaela LaFrac here. The podcast you are about to listen to has been edited for clarity and brevity. I'm Mitch Wirtlieb in for Michaela LaFrac. And today on Vermont Edition, cue up the Barry White music, it's Valentine's Day. So later in the hour, we'll be speaking all about love and the research that goes into it. We'll be talking with Dr. Jeremiah Dickerson. He's a child and adolescent psychiatrist at the University of Vermont Medical Center. He has studied how humanity loves. And you can email us about your Valentine experiences, for good or ill, at Vermont Edition at vermontpublic.org. Vermont Edition at vermontpublic.org. We might even share your story on the air. But before we head into that, we are speaking with Vermont's lone House representative, Becca Ballant, today with a focus on the housing crisis. We feel it here in Vermont, just as the rest of the country does. Before she was elected, Representative Ballant was an advocate for affordable housing at the Vermont State House, and she's now bringing that advocacy to a national audience by introducing a bill that would spend $500 billion to help housing become more affordable. The legislation is dubbed the Community Housing Act, or CHA. The measure would also prevent landlords from price fixing, that is colluding with competitors to raise the price of rentals. It would also remove zoning barriers that push back against construction and give renters the financial support they need to avoid eviction. According to the bill, the average rent in the U.S. has increased by 24 percent from the years 2020 to 2023. And the bill also points out that housing costs are soaring, with low and moderate income borrowers spending between 30 to 50 percent of their income on mortgage payments. We're going to dive deeper into this bill and other top of mind topics from Washington. So joining us from Washington, D.C. is Representative Becca Ballant. Welcome. Good morning, Mitch. How are you? Or afternoon, I guess. Good afternoon. It is just afternoon now. And listen, I've just got to get this out of the way now, given the date that we're speaking. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you so much. And Mitch, um, you may not know that Ballant is actually Hungarian for Valentin, which is, of course, related to Valentine. So I always see this as my day, actually. So I'm happy to be here. We're going to have to do a whole separate (laughs) show on that. That's fascinating. Thank you for letting us know. Listeners, you can join this conversation. Have you been struggling to keep up with mortgage payments or rent? Give us a call at 1-800-639-2211. Or if you have a question for Representative Ballant about her bill, again, that number is 800-639-2211. You can also send an email to Vermont Edition at vermontpublic.org. So, Representative Ballant, let's start with this bill you're introducing. Um, Thumbnail sketch here. What are the key measures in it? I really appreciate it because it's a it's a really weighty bill, and we took many months in developing it, but I'll give you the top lines. So we're looking at uh, $500 billion of investment, so half a trillion dollars. It is an investment commensurate with the need. Uh, Vermont is struggling, as you know, with a housing crisis, but that is also true across the country. We are um, short of a nearly $4 million um, homes for people. And this, of course, is impacting individuals and families, but it's also impacting the, the economy, both locally and nationally. So massive investment. Um, strong perpetual affordability protections, because that's definitely something that I've learned in my work doing housing in in Vermont and now at the federal level, is that you have to make sure that you're not just looking at getting people into housing, but how do you make it possible for them to stay housed? Because that is always preferable than having people lose their housing and have to start over again. Uh, It also, again, keeps people in their homes. I'm looking at fairness for rural renters, Um, At you alluded to at the top about price fixing. We also know there's a a national crisis with um, hedge funds and um, other uh, multi, uh, you know, multi corporation investments at the national level, buying up millions of homes here in the United States and making the costs uh, out of reach for for regular folks and constantly looking at paving more pathways to home ownership so that folks can build up equity. So those are the broad strokes. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at our um, shared equity models in Vermont and how the community land trusts in Vermont have worked to, to get people into housing. And I am so excited about this bill. I have worked on it um, in the legislature, as you said, and we made some really big investments um, under 
uh, the governor's leadership as a time when we came together in a bipartisan manner to make these these big investments, millions of dollars. But we know that that was really a down payment on the kind of investment we need at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say I am informed in my opinions about this issue as not just as a legislator and now as a member of Congress, but as a teacher who saw firsthand what happens with kids and their ability to learn when they don't have stable, secure housing. Um, and I certainly see that as a mom. Uh, we talk a lot at my kitchen table with, with our kids. I've got two teens and they are giving voice to something I hear across the state, which parents, kids worried that they're not gonna be able to find housing in Vermont that they can afford. And certainly even just the, the lack of stock is mm. an issue. Forget even if you can afford it, they're just, the homes are not available right now. So very excited to finally introduce this bill that we've been working on for so long and would love to hear uh, stories from Vermonters about their experiences with housing. What are the other issues that I should be thinking about long-term? Obviously this is gonna be a, a multi-year push, especially since I am in the minority and going to have to make the case to my colleagues across the aisle which I believe I can because it touches every congressional district. Well, you've definitely identified the critical need with this bill. Everyone knows the housing crunch is, is really serious. And by the way, if you do want to ask Representative Ballant a question, again, the number to call is 800-639-2211. But Representative Ballant, you, you said it yourself, uh, the cost of this bill, half a trillion dollars. Where would that money come from? So what we're looking at is having an investment that is commensurate with the problem. And we were, I was literally just in uh, a budget meeting. I, I serve, for those of you who don't know, I serve on the budget committee and the judiciary committee. And this morning we we're meeting with the congressional budget, budget office, looking at when was the last time we've had such a robust investment in, in housing. And the, the member from the CBO that was with us could not remember a time when we have really made this a priority. And so it is a statement of values that we know. Sorry, we have a little glitch here. Sorry that we're Glad we haven't some... lost you. You're still with us. Go ahead. OK, fantastic. Um, that the the programs, many of these programs that I am asking for. Oh, dropped out there one second, uh, Representative Ballant. I hope we're going to get you back. We're going to effort to do Housing that. Housing may be familiar with the Capital Magnet Fund. That what I'm looking at is not really um, creating things whole cloth. We're looking at mechanisms that we have. We have a few things in here that that are new, but mostly it's saying we've got the mechanisms. We should be investing not just in the people and these these families, but also in the economy as a whole. And we've had the most significant recovery since the pandemic, as you can see, as you look around the world, the U.S. has had the strongest recovery since the pandemic. We learned a lot of lessons around housing from the pandemic, and I want those to continue. I'm curious about how the money would get to people. Let's say in your perfect world, the bill passes, but you know, evictions can be on a tight deadline for a lot of people. How would the bill ensure that the money gets to the people who need it on time before they get evicted? So one of the things that um, I know a lot of Vermonters are familiar with is the ERAP program. It's the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which was very successful during the pandemic. Again, we're having these occasional uh, dropouts. Go ahead, Re Representative Ballant. A little bit of a uh, dropout there, but just keep keep on going. You're still with us. Okay. So we are looking to make a huge investment in the ERAP program to make it permanent. Because as you say, you know, people need that emergency assistance right away. And we know that the costs to individuals and families, but also to um, the bottom line for landlords as well, like it costs money when you don't have somebody in, in that unit. So it's actually and when you're able to give that money directly to folks who are in danger of losing their housing so they can stay housed. I'm glad you mentioned landlords because I'm wondering about the criteria, what it would be for a renter who feels they're being unfairly forced out. Because some landlords might say they have no choice but to evict someone if they're not receiving timely payments. How does the bill address that question of fairness to both renters and landlords? 
Well, really, what I want you to understand about this, uh, we don't really address that issue within the bill. That's not um, in the purview of this bill, though. Certainly, I have heard that from landlords um, across Vermont that this this is always a struggle, right? You want to make sure that you have the ability if you have um, tenants who are making it difficult for other tenants to live um peaceful uh, you know, existence in your homes. What we're really looking at is price fixing that is going on nationally among landlords. So we have learned that large landlords are using software and algorithms to illegally price fix. And so I want more um, investments in the antitrust enforcements that can prevent this from happening. So it is a, a federal bill that I designed to work in Vermont, but I'm also looking nationally because whenever you're trying to get an investment of this size, you have to address issues that other uh, Congress folks are are seeing in their districts. And we have heard that that price fixing among the larger landlords um, is is at crisis levels right now. We've seen the rent increased by nearly 25% in the last year nationally. I know Vermonters have expressed to me in personal uh, individual conversations that they're seeing those increases locally as well. And of course, some of this is about prices going up, but if you have a, a an apartment that includes um, heat and water, prices are, um, they are inflated over what they were several years ago. So that that is part of the calculation here. But we're trying to go after these these big a actors that are really complicating the housing market for so many Americans. And your bill does address this issue of, I'm really curious about what you said about using computer software to fix prices. I mean, briefly, tell me a little bit more about that. How does this kind of collusion work with that kind of software? So essentially, when you have a large um, landlord that, again, I want to go back to the issue of um, hedge funds buying up millions of homes mm. in this country, um, you have a situation where you may have one holding entity control thousands of units of housing, and they can set a criteria within software to decide what that price should be across across a town, across a city, across a state. And what it means is that consumers don't have options. They can't say, well, okay, you're offering this unit with these amenities or maybe no amenities. And you know, generally in this country, we say, well, you vote with your pocketbook. But if in fact, the uh, entity is controlling all of the available units in that area, then you don't, you can't vote with your pocketbook, you're stuck. Hmm. And so it is, uh, you know, I don't want to get too partisan here, because it I'm really looking at a bipartisan movement on the on this issue. I do have concerns that in the past, we have uh, in the last few years really not been able to make uh, enforcement actions when it comes to antitrust. And it's impacting just regular people, regardless of your zip code. Yeah, I want to get to that question of partisanship in just a moment. But first, let's go to the lines. Uh, Chris is with us from Richmond. Hi, Chris. You're on Vermont Edition with Representative Becca Ballant. Hello, uh, uh, Representative Ballant. Can you hear me? I can. Good morning or afternoon. I <laughs> Good afternoon. I apologize for the background noise. Uh, first of all, I think you're doing a great job, and uh, thank you very much for uh, working on this bill. Um, we're really uh, concerned about the state of housing in Vermont and the uh, availability of affordable housing. But one thing I didn't hear you mention was, uh, does the bill have any provisions for uh, the affordable heating and, uh, and uh, powering of uh, new homes in Vermont, new and existing homes? And does it do anything about trying to decrease the carbon footprint of housing? I really appreciate that question. And one of the struggles that we had in crafting this bill, and it, it runs almost to 50 pages, that we know that there are other important provisions related to housing that are also moving in other bills currently in Congress. And so when you look at the bipartisan tax bill that we passed in the House just a few weeks ago, it goes to the heart of some of those questions that you had. And so 
it is it is always so hard when you're trying to do an omnibus bill to, to include everything. And I had my team look at other bills that are in motion right now that could address those concerns. And of course, we have a, a huge champion in issues related to green energy. Our neighbor to the south in Massachusetts, you have um, Ed Markey, who has been doing incredible work on issues related to, to climate and housing. And the other piece that you didn't mention that I know is important in Vermont, especially is the amount of housing we've lost because of climate change. When you look at the devastating flooding in, in Barrie uh, and other places that we know that when we, we build back from this um, situation that we had this summer in Vermont, we have to have an eye to how do you build in more resiliency going forward. And, you know, I have talked with an, another colleague of mine from Hawaii, Jill Takuda, who they didn't face flooding this summer, they faced horrible wildfires. And she's a big supporter of this bill as well. And she's supportive of our initiatives outside of this bill to amend FEMA, that the the provisions in FEMA were not designed for what we're facing right now, which is climate change. And so I really appreciate the question. It is really important to me. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to outline for folks on our website other bills that are moving that are related to housing. And it, and that would be why it is not in this particular bill. But thank you so much for calling in. Really appreciate the call, Chris. Um, Representative Ballant, uh, one of the things I'm curious about is this is a big, sweeping national bill. It's addressing a problem, as we said at the top, that every buddy in every state in the country is experiencing. But different states have different laws, as you well know, working on these issues in Vermont. And I'm curious about something like in a state like Vermont, where Act 250, while expected to undergo some changes, is still for now the working model on, on development. And it can be restrictive as to what gets built and where. There's also the question of, you know, the NIMBY question, not in my backyard. Folks may be resistant to having new affordable housing built in their neck of the woods. How does the bill address those kind of questions? I'm so glad you asked because um, I neglected to say at the top when I was uh, talking about the top lines that the this bill, the Community Housing Act, designates a new federal office to address issues around exclusionary zoning practices. And it, and it funds a new grant program to encourage, and that's the important word here, to encourage state and local communities to modify their zoning rules. It is not uh, a stick, it's a carrot which I think is really important. And I know, because I, I do follow Vermont News, I know that the legislature um, is working hard on a summer study um, proposal that, that came through around this particular issue of finding a balance between you know, protecting the environment um, and, and this, the strength of Act 250 and how that has done so much good for so many parts of Vermont and finding those places where um, we can come together to make compromise and make it easier for more housing. I think Vermonters want both things. I really applaud the work that the legislature has been doing on this. This is a tough nut to crack. I know I've I've got the I've got the scars to, sh to show uh, on this, but we do need to have a robust conversation in Vermont about how we can hold both these things. And I think it's really interesting that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board is is essentially their mission is both things protecting the environment and making sure there is housing available for all. And so we really wanted to provide guidelines for for people across the nation, building on a program that the Biden uh, housing plan uh, introduced called the Unlocking Possibilities Program. And we want to build on that and say there are ways to do both. And we have to constantly be looking at this balance in Vermont. And I just have to tell you, everywhere I go in Vermont, people are struggling deeply with housing. Every community, every demographic, and we have got to get serious about the investment that's needed here. All right. Before we get to a break, I want to take one more call. We have a representative from Bennington on the line, I believe. Jim is with us. Hi, Jim. You're on with Representative Becca Ballant. Uh, good afternoon, uh Congresswoman Ballant, and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Um, the idea that I have, as you well know, having uh, been a former senator, the state of Vermont has spent over $200 million to house the homeless. 
Now, with that kind of money, we could have built tiny homes for the homeless and give them homes. Um, and what, if any, part of the bill could address such an idea in the state of Vermont, and that is building tiny homes for the approximately 4,000 uh, homeless in Vermont. And uh, last question I'll take uh, off the air is, when are you coming to Bennington? <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. I'll start with the, the second one. Um, it has, and I want to say this to Vermonters uh, generally, is that this has been uh, a, a Congress for the record books and not in a good way. And there have been many in district or in Vermont weeks that have been canceled for me because of the dysfunction here around uh, federal funding. And it has meant that it has cut into my my trips to Vermont, which is um, just personally very difficult for me. But um, certainly we did get in my first year to every single county and we are gonna um, make a plan to get back to Bennington really soon. Cause I know that I, I live in Brattleboro. I know Bennington and Brattleboro share a lot of the, the same struggles. And so I really appreciate that. And I will, I will certainly talk to my team and get that scheduled. And so, you know, to your question, it it's so challenging because you've got a situation where you have people being housed in the motels uh, in Vermont that, you know, it's not an ideal situation for them, for their families. It is a stopgap measure that's gone on for years now at this point. And we literally don't have the units to move folks out of. And as you say, a lot of the money that could have gone to building new units um, that those ERAP funds went to temporarily housing. And so there are a lot of options in my bill for extreme low income uh, Vermonters. And it is provisions in this bill are attempting to make housing, whether it's rental or home ownership affordable for every income level. And it is, there are no, there's no one lever that we can pull right now to solve this problem. But this is the conundrum we find ourselves in, not just in Vermont, but other places like California that have a really severe housing shortage is you have to house people in the short term because it's just physically and emotionally unsafe for people to be sleeping out in the woods at night. And at the same time, you've got to build more units, but the supply chain issues and inflationary pressures and some price gouging um, has impacted our ability to build more units. So I was just talking with someone yesterday uh, in, in Bells Falls that we were um, charting a course to build you know, a significant number of houses from the investments we made from the American Rescue Plan. But because of the price increases and in materials, we're going to have to build about um, a half fewer uh, units than we thought. And so it, there are, um, I wish we had more time. We can dive, we dive in more of the details. Um, but I do encourage everyone to, to look at uh, the, the bill we've posted parts of the bill on, on Instagram. We'll continue to use our website to get the details out and uh, certainly always open to feedback from Vermonters about other aspects of this crisis that need to be addressed. This is an ongoing conversation and I'm just so proud to be able to take my fire and energy and commitment to this issue of housing uh, to Congress because we, we need leadership on this. 